Um, okay, so in the book of Revelation, we're going to be picking up in chapter 8 and verse 13. Uh, but we last covered the beginning uh, 12 verses, the front 12, uh, three weeks ago. And so as much as uh, I know y'all are looking forward to it, it might be good to uh, do a little bit of a recap here on where we're at so far in the book of Revelation. What happened in chapter 1? <laughs> chapter 1 is a long time ago. You're right. <laughs> Chapter 1. Right, chapter 1, he's writing to the churches. Uh, yeah, that's where we have mentioning of the Godhead, the Trinity. It's the beginning of everything that we're studying, right? Chapter 1 is the beginning of the vision. This is a vision that John's supposed to be writing down and sending to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Chapter 2 and chapter 3, what happened? The different churches, what's the problem of, the problems that they're having, more or less. Right. Um, they received, the seven churches of Asia Minor now receive an individual uh, note, if you will. And um, there we find Jesus writing to the seven churches personally. And you have how many churches that are doing nothing but good? Two. Yeah, the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia. How many churches are doing nothing but bad? It would also be two. Two churches are doing nothing but good. Two churches are doing nothing but bad. And then you have three churches that find themselves in the middle of it. Uh, three churches that... Uh, they were sound in some areas, but they were also faulty in other areas. And um, the what what's been the thrust of the or the thrust of message given to those churches that had things to fix, even though they did good, and then those who had things to fix and they needed to fix everything yeah. to repent. And that's been what it is. That's what Christ is trying to get across to them is you need to repent. Um, I can't help but look at the, the seven churches of Asia Minor and think about some of the doctrines, uh, the false doctrines that are basically disproved by Jesus simply telling them to repent. You have, for instance, the uh, with those three churches that do good and they do evil, uh, but they still need to repent. Uh, I think about what Paul said in uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, right? It's You can't do that. You can't be doing some good and some evil and then receive the reward of doing good, right? And then when I look at those two churches that are doing the, nothing but bad, it uh, dispels the doctrine of one saved, always saved. Just because you enter into the church through the waters of baptism doesn't mean that you stay in the church whenever you walk out of it. If you remove yourself from the church, then you're removed from the church. And as you look at those two congregations uh, who, were, who uh, were doing nothing but evil, they had removed themselves, or at least they were in the process of removing themselves. And so Jesus, he comes to them and he pleads with them. And that is best seen in the church of Laodicea, where Jesus said, Behold, I am at the door standing, and I am knocking. He is knocking at the door, and he, bid, he bids them to open it. And if they do open it, he will go in, he'll dine with them. That means have fellowship with them, and they'll be in fellowship with him. And that's really what we're always striving for as Christians, is to maintain that fellowship with God. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with with one another. That's us and the Father have fellowship with one another. And the blood of His Son Jesus cleanses us from all our sins, all our iniquities. Uh, chapter 4, what happened? The throne, the throne in heaven. That's the throne in heaven. Uh, the throne in heaven is, a really, is really a pivotal scene in the uh, book of Revelation because as I've, I've made this point a couple times already, in chapters 2 and 3 you have the corrections that need to be given and sometimes when people are addressed concerning the corrections they need to make, they think that the corrections cannot be made. 
Sometimes they think that, well, they're not enough of a person to make those corrections, or they might think that those corrections are so uh, difficult to make that they simply themselves, they cannot do it, or maybe that their peers cannot do it. Well, chapter four, when we look at the 24 elders that are there, we get the idea of the corrections can be made. The 24 elders, if we understand them to be a figure of the redeemed saints, then what is true of those people? They're forgiven. And if they're forgiven, what's true of that? Salvation. Salvation. They had sinned. As we look at these 24 elders, these people that are a figure, if you will, of the saints, we're looking at people who were just like all of men. They had fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and verse 23. Just like all of men who their due wage was, uh, was death because the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 and verse 23. We're looking at people who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 7, having their transgressions forgiven them. And then we're looking at people who continually faced the battle of temptation. And yet they overcame. And so the really, what I think one of the key messages in chapter 4, along with just really the majesty, the glory, and the worship that is to be ascribed to the Father is that what God is asking his people to do is not unreasonable and it's not impossible. It's completely possible and heaven is going to be the proof of that. Heaven is going to be the proof that everything which God had placed upon us as expectations of being his people are going to be able to be attained and they will be attained. There will be people in heaven and those people are going to be just like us. And what we really need to decide is, are we going to be just like them? They overcame their temptations. They fought the good fight. Are we going to do the same? Chapter 5, what happened? Jesus, Jesus. This, scroll. Jesus holds the scroll. The scroll is presented, right? And so you had that scroll presented, and it was almost like a scene of hopelessness in heaven. You had the angel uh, who, who was almost crying and even uh, translated to uh, John himself crying as John's witnessing this he sees the uh, he sees the intensity of the scene you have the angel you have the scroll and he's crying out who is worthy to open the seals he says there's not a single part not a single of the of the angels that are open there's not a single of the 24 elders that are worthy to open it who will open it and so then you have the lamb emerging and that's, that's where all the hopelessness is thrown away and hope uh, shines forth. Hope is there for everyone to see. The lamb has the scroll in his hands and they ascribe worship to him. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to open the scroll. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive worship. As we look at chapter 5, just like in chapter 4, we're presented with the, the sovereignty of God, the glory of God, the, the worship that is due to him. In chapter 5, we see the same being brought out about Christ. But it goes deeper than just uh, we worship him because of, you know, in a sense, who he is. We worship him for a reason further than the fact that he's deity. But we worship him because of what he did as deity. And that's what we see in that first burst of praise there in chapter 5. He is the one who has provided redemption for his people. He has made his people into a kingdom, a kingdom of priests and, and things which are to be gloried in. That's why we worship Jesus. And I think that's the big point in chapter 5. Why do we worship Jesus? Because of what he has done for his people. He's not a dictator who sits upon the throne um, and demands worship. He's a servant, right? Mark 10 and verse 45. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why he came, and that's why he is worthy of worship. He set forth the example for us. He told his disciples, The greatest among you will be the one who serves, Mark 10 and verse 44. And then he showed us. And it's been illustrated so often in Scripture that he will or has done the same thing. That's why he's the greatest in heaven.
he made the greatest sacrifice. Chapter 6, what happened? The seals are being opened. And as the seals are being opened one by one, there's a, there's, there's a ton of things to process. And um, if we go through them one by one, you see uh, different things which I believe pertain to the, the plan of the redemption of man uh, being involved. Um, chapter 6, I believe the, the big focus there is to see that God has a plan for redemption. And this plan, it, it, it's powerful in its working. It's not just something, uh, as someone might mock, that could have been done like that. It's not something that could be done with the snap of a finger. It's something that was worked out and something that was designed in the mind of God. So we look about the, at the uh, redemption of man. We know from Revelation 13 and verse 8 that Jesus was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. We know that as we consider the, the uh, mystery of the gospel, that it was hidden from the minds of men, Ephesians 3, verses 8 through 11, and that it was something that the angels desired so uh, intensely to know, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses uh, 10 and 11. Our salvation is a very precious thing. It is a design thing. It is a hard work for thing, and so it should be treated as such. I think that might be something to consider from chapter 6. Also from chapter 6, we see that the opening of the seals kind of present themselves in a negative way. Each time a seal is opened, there's some sort of negative event that takes place. And so it's, it's important to recognize that salvation isn't um, rainbows and flowers. Salvation is a difficult thing, and it comes with difficult uh, things to process. And, and so let's not uh, paint the, the picture um, as it's often portrayed maybe among the denominations that Christianity is just happy-go-lucky and everything's honky-dory, right? It's, it's really not. There's difficulty. Uh, however, we see in chapter uh, 8, whenever that seventh seal is finally open, that everything works together for good for those who love the Lord, Romans 8 and verse 28. Everything works together for those who would be sealed by God. Everything works together for those who would obey his voice. That seventh seal being opened is a beautiful image of the righteous judgment uh, of God. And it translates into the elevation of the saints and also the casting down of the wicked. Chapter 7. Chapter 7 fits itself right in the middle of chapter 6 and chapter 8. Uh, both numerically and in, in what's taking place. Chapter 7 is an interlude of sorts. What happened in chapter 7? The 144,000 are sealed, and we see that he goes through and he seals 12,000 of each of the tribes of Israel. Uh, the idea of that 144,000 is a great multitude of people being saved and we see that in chapter uh, 9 chapter 9 uh, John says after this I looked and saw a great multitude of people a number that couldn't even be numbered so as we look at the 144,000 it's important to reconcile that with the great multitude that cannot even be numbered 144,000 is a symbolic number a symbolic number and it should only be treated with that symbolism that symbolism yeah. being that 12 and 12 144, 12 representing the religious order. So you have 12, the 12 tribes of Israel, 12, the 12 uh, apostles. You have the Christian dispensation, the Old Testament dispensation. Those two come together to represent 144. That is the redeemed of all ages. And then take that, multiply that by a thousand. The idea there is that it exceeds in greatness. And so... Is that where the... The only way to get to 144,000? 144, yes. 144,000? Yes. So we're down to 1 nothing. If we do more than that, already in the world, I think I can make it. Yeah. Yeah, and you think about 144,000, hold that. Yeah, in comparison with how many people have existed in all of mankind, and you're taking uh, what Jesus said, where uh, he talks about the narrow way and few will enter in. You're making that few into very, very few. You know, uh, you're going a little bit further 
uh, not a little bit, a whole lot further than what Scripture has to say on the matter. I, I believe there's some things that we might look at here in chapter 9 um, that will help to uh, potentially dispel that idea of 144,000 being saved. But chapter 7, that's that's the big thing taking place. Uh, you have the, the interlude of hope, and that hope is that a great amount of people are going to be saved, and a great amount of people are going to enjoy the riches and the and the uh, and the blessing of a dwelling place with God. Chapter eight, we talked um, about verses one through twelve. What's taking place there from verses six through twelve? Seals. Not the seals, uh, but the sounding of trumpets. And with each of the sounding of these trumpets, it's believed that these are um, incomplete judgments that are taking place. So these are each of these sounding of the trumpet is a judgment uh, being provided against, this time, the wicked. And so you see that the wicked are being judged. And so as you go through it, uh, with the first uh, trumpet being blown, you have a limited amount of people being uh, judged. Chapter, or verses 8 through 9, you then find um, that the mountain, a mountain refers to a kingdom symbolically. And so you have the, a kingdom that's being tossed into the, into the water after it's been um, uh, burned with fire. And as a result, people um, are going to suffer the consequence of, of that kingdom being destroyed. And we see people in the figure of a sea. Uh, the sea has been used uh, symbolically to refer to a great amount of people. Then verses 10 through 11, you have a great star falling from heaven. Um, and, and it's blazing down. It, it fell on a third of the rivers and on the spring water. The name of the star is Wormwood. Uh, Wormwood is a type of... Um, Almost like a type of root. It's very, it, it's very bitter, and whenever it comes into contact with water, um, that water becomes contaminated with the wormwood. And if you drink enough of it, it can actually kill you. And it was really, it was actually used. Uh, I believe Moses used it as a threat against the Israelite people that if you practice idolatry, I will make you drink wormwood. Basically, I'm going to make you drink this poisonous water, and it's going to kill you. Uh, there's some uh, belief that the waters in Meribah, remember the waters in Meribah, they were called Meribah because it was bitter. They believe that it may have been filled with uh, wormwood. Uh, but this wormwood, so as you think about it, you have the great star falling. A great star probably represents a, uh, a king of sorts. And as it falls down and it gets into the water, it kills the people. The idea there is that the great king, most kings in, in the day were um, trying to elevate themselves to the status of God. Uh, you see that in the book of Isaiah, chapter, I believe, verse 14, or chapter 14, I believe, verse 13, where in the King James it makes mention of the name Lucifer. In other translations, it'll say the morning star. Uh, that, that star, in that case, represented uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar was humbled by God and those in Babylon, they suffered the shame of Nebuchadnezzar's humbling. And so the idea here is the same, that you have someone who has elevated himself to the status of God. People have begun to worship him. And then after he's humbled, the people are uh, dismayed by his humbling. And the idea here is that they're even going to die because of the idolatry that they committed in elevating this person to that status. Um, <clears throat> Verses 12, or just verse 12 here, you have the, uh, the blowing of the fourth trumpet. And there you see the uh, darkening of the uh, moon, stars, and basically all the light. Um, the idea there is that there is going to be calamity that falls upon the earth uh, in these judgments. And then we pick up in verse uh, 13. Uh, where we left off it says then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead Woe 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 to those who dwell on the earth and the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow Pronouncings uh, pronouncements of woes These are being placed upon the earth dwellers. This is um, 
And then when we say earth dwellers, what, what's trying to be said there is people who are of the world, right? Even the Christians were living on the earth at this point, right? But these judgments aren't against the church, and we see that, or we're going to see that in chapter 9. Um, but these are on people who are worldly, and so these woes, these are synonymous, synonymous with destruction and with judgment. Yes? Um, in verse 13 in the New King James, it says, And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven. How do you get eagle from angel? I mean, I mean, I have eagle written down because in another class I was in one time they said eagle, but it's in Matthew twenty nine. You know, one says that it's a okay. that's the version that they use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the American Center says eagle, and then um, probably the translation variation that exists there has to do with chapter four. We have the four living creatures that represent. Uh, at least in some fashion, either all the angels or a special class of the angels, and one of those have the face like an eagle or wings like an eagle. Um, and so, yeah, I was just always confused about that because I never yeah, how can they got angel with eagle? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so you have the uh, the eagle coming, crying. He's pronouncing woes. It's destruction upon those who dwell on the earth. And um, this destruction that is going to be pronounced upon those who live on earth are seen in the next three uh, sounding of the trumpet. So the fourth, or rather the uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh. And if you realize this, uh, the seventh isn't until chapter 11 in verses uh, 15 through 19. And so whenever you come to chapter 10 and chapter 11, you're, you're again, just like in chapter 6 through chapter 8, as you're looking at the seals being open, you have an interlude of sorts that help to, uh, I guess, uh, provide detail to the situation. Um, let's, let's look here in chapter 9. Chapter 9, what we just want to look at here is the sounding of the fifth trumpet. And this is also at the same time the first woe that is pronounced. We see that in verse uh, 12. Right. Right. It's a scene of destruction. Um, looking at the first trumpet here, uh, let's look at verses uh, 1 through 6 here. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Uh, some translations might say abyss. Um, verse 2, he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions um, of the earth. Verse 4, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any grain plant or any tree, but only those people who, who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Okay. Uh, looking here at verses 1 and 2 specifically, you have the key that was given to the bottomless pit. The key here being given to the star, or what appears to be um, a star, that had fallen from heaven. The question is, you know, considering what we talked about in, uh, in our recap here is this star that had fallen from heaven is it a person of great power as it is in chapter 8 verse 10 or is it satan well he said he had the keys and i don't think he would have the keys you don't think satan would have the keys 
He has the keys in chapter 1 and verse 18. He has the keys to uh, death and Hades. Um, well, it's possible chapter 9 is taking place after chapter 1, right? Chapter 1, you have uh, Christ presented as victorious Savior, right? I have died. I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades in my hand. He owns them. He possesses them. But if we're going through and we're looking at the opening of the seals, it's almost as if whenever the seals are open, we're dropping back in time to an extent or a transference of time, perhaps. Because in chapter five, Jesus is present in front of uh, John and he has the scroll in his hand. And then you have the opening of the scroll. And the opening of the scrolls uh, of the scroll, the opening of the seals has to do with judgments that are being pronounced. And these judgments uh, particularly go against the church. These are persecutions against the church. And then chapter seven, you have that hope of heaven. Chapter eight, you have the, uh, the hope of God's promises to fulfill everything he's done for the Christian. And then we're moving into these woes and these woes are, are the sounding of the trumpet or is a place upon the people of this earth. So maybe it could be that there's a lapse in time that's taking place. We've gone back or uh, maybe it is the case uh, whoever it is, right? Because whoever it is has the keys, whether it's a great person or it's Satan, they have the keys. So it would, in a sense, uh, mean that Jesus gave them up, at least for a period of time. Would that be outside the character of God to give uh, the keys to someone else? Has God ever given permission to do evil? Job. Job. What's that? He allowed it. Yeah, God allowed it. He permitted uh, Satan to do what Satan desired to do. Satan's desire was to make a fool out of God by tempting Job and to change Job's uh, dependency from God to material things. God allowed it. But were there stipulations? Yes, there were stipulations. You cannot kill him. See, I think about Job and that situation between God and Job seems very similar to the situation here in verses 1 through 6. Whoever it is, if it's a great person of power or if it's Satan himself, personally I believe it's Satan himself, um, if they are given the keys, they are allowed to do whatever evil it is that they're desiring to do. Because God's giving them the opportunity, just like he does with us. He gives us the opportunity to choose good or evil. Now, some people have made it their nature to choose evil. Satan's nature is to choose evil. That evil is being done with the stipulation of you cannot kill. Maybe the key is there in verse 1. To fall from heaven, not to come from heaven upon one from one own accord, but the ability to come and go. It's the wording there indicates um, kind of a removal or a you know not worthy type. You get a picture of some something there on the negative side of a picture of coming from heaven to earth, but maybe not from one's own accord. Yep, being kicked out. Yeah, kind of. kicked out of heaven. Uh, as I think about, and, and you know that's really uh, the idea. It's taking place there. As you look at chapter 8 and verse 10, I think a difference that that uh, can help us uh, see whether it's a great person of power or if it's Satan himself. Chapter 8 and verse 10, the star fell from heaven. That's present tense. Chapter 9 and verse 1, the star was fallen from heaven. That's past tense. Um, and I think um, to further support the idea that the star here represents Satan, instead of a, a person of power or significance, uh, it could be seen in Luke chapter 10. Look over there at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the 70 or the 72, whatever your translation says. And then in chapter, in uh, verse 17, the 72, they return, okay? It says in verse 17, they, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. 
Okay, they have the they have because they are going by the authority of Christ. They have dominion over the demons. The demons are doing as they say. Verse eighteen. He said to them, "I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven." Okay. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nothing shall hurt you. That's pretty reminiscent of what we're seeing here in chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9. So Revelation chapter 9, I, I believe that uh, looking at the context, this fallen star is Satan. This fallen star is, uh, if it is Satan, it is uh, pretty much serving us as an introduction into chapter 12 in which we'll see Satan, the great uh, beast, the, the dragon, being cast down to earth and uh, being bound in chains. Um, if it is Satan, it seems to me that he is a complete opposite of the bright and morning star that we read of in Revelation 22 and verse 16, who is Jesus and who holds the keys of death and Hades in his hand. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 18. Chapter, chapter 20 is where you find uh, Satan being cast in to the bottomless pit. And so, um, yeah. And then that's how he has the keys. Yeah. Chapter 1 and verse 18. He has the keys of death and Hades because he's conquered the grave. Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. He partook of the same things as the children do, as flesh and blood, and he suffered death, death so that he could overcome the one who has the power of death, that being Satan. Um, if we keep this in, in the context here, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12 is a woe. That's destruction being pronounced. And so let's look at verse 1 and remember who is responsible for what is going to be done. Satan. Now, a lot of times people look at what's bad in the world and they place that burden upon God. Well, God did this. Oh, God gave the option for this to be done. Satan and the angels, just like men, are free moral agents. And the option has been presented to them. You can do good or you can do evil. Satan Here's the keys. What are you going to do? Good or evil? And Satan goes and does evil. Nothing? I, it looks like you had something to say. I'm not a very good person. Okay. Bring up the question. Sir. Maybe this is time to play some good. Anything bad happened in my life, Satan did it. Oh, so it's time to place to bring it up. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, no. I mean, uh, so I think about this. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 3. Paul tells us that we're dead in our trespasses, following the, the spirit of disobedience, the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan. There, the introduction of evil, that, that burden is on Satan. The decision to follow evil, that decision, is, that burden is placed upon us. Uh, we made that decision. Just as Satan had the opportunity to do good or evil, we had the opportunity to do good or evil. And so just because something bad happens in my life, now, at, at least in the context of, uh, of sin, that's our responsibility. That's not Satan's. Now, uh, we talk about I don't know, uh, cancer or something like that? I don't know how to answer that. I don't think so. I just think that's the natural order of things uh, that was introduced by sin. And so uh, I guess really if you're going to place that burden on anyone, you place on, um, on Adam. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 it said, death entered by one man and death has spread to all men. Uh, maybe that's placed on Adam and Eve. The introduction of all those diseases and such. Um, well, to some of our decisions can impact each other. You know, we talk about sin and it goes to kill. You know, right. Whenever you get to that, that's that's one person acting upon another. 
in an evil way. Yeah. All is evil. But yet, one loses his life. And many times in the past, as we see the apostles and those in the first century, they were killed. You know, and, uh, yeah. You have James in Acts chapter 12 who's beheaded. Yeah. Not because of what he was doing. Right. He was doing what was right. The consequence of other people's actions. <coughs> Sometimes for evil, sometimes good. You have accidents, but many times for evil. Yeah. Does that help, Almost? You know, it comes to mind. Uh, I can't remember her name. You know, maybe you had a car truck wreck. Sophia. Sophia. Okay. Some say that happened. Satan made that happen. I don't believe that. I don't believe Satan works that way. No. Said, anything bad happens in our life, that's Satan's work. If I'm off call from Jerusalem or something like that, I'll doubt it. Yeah. And it hurts. And you got to stay away from him. Yeah. Does Satan put your couch there? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Does Satan put your couch there? <laughs> they move it out in front of you? He probably did. 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 I'll tell you what. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people will come to that conclusion because that, that's a lot easier than owning up to your own faults sometimes, you know. That's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to say, you know, I, I cursed because Satan put out a car in front of me and I hit him instead of saying, you know, I cursed because... I really lack the control over my over my tongue that I need. Um, I really, you know, and cursing doesn't always just come out. It stays right here sometimes. So it might be a lack of the ability to purify my mind. Uh, not the lack of the ability, but the lack of effort to purify my mind. So, yeah, I see what you're what you're asking there, and. Uh, that, that doesn't seem within the bounds no. of what Satan can do and how he's allowed to work. Although it's interesting to think about. Interesting to think about. Um, okay, chapter 9. Woo! We got six more minutes. <laughs> Woo! All right. Uh, chapter 9, verse 1. We're looking at Satan, and he has the key. The key represents power. And uh, this key, of course, has been given based upon limitations. You cannot kill. We see that in verse uh, 5. Same as the limitations given to Satan in the testing of Job in chapter 1 and verse 12, as well as chapter 2 and verse 6 of Job. Um, this key, what it does is it grants him access to open the bottomless pit. Uh, the bottomless pit is the dwelling place, according to Luke 8 and verse 31, of the demons. And this is from where the locusts are going to emerge. This bottomless pit is also where the spirit of persecution arose from. We see that in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7, as well as Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8. And we're going to see here in chapter 9 and verse 11 that it is ruled by one who is named the destroyer. Um, and this bottomless pit, as I mentioned earlier, is also the place where Satan himself will be cast, uh, Revelation 20 and verse 1, as well as verse 3. However, it's important to recognize the fact that the bottomless pit is not hell. Okay, the bottomless pit is not hell. How? What's different that we see right here between the bottomless pit and hell? Does the bottomless pit seem to be like a temporary place or a permanent place? Well, it seems like a temporary place if the locusts are coming out. There's a way out of this one. Huh? There's a way out of this one. Yeah, there's a way out. There's not a way out of hell. Also, just to portray it further, if you look in Revelation 20 right quick. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 3, you have Satan being cast into the pit, uh, and then in verse uh, ten, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beasts and the false prophets were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You know that's a, that's a distinction, right? Chapter twenty or chapter twenty, verse three, he's put in one place, and in chapter twenty, verse ten, 
he's put into another place. There seems to be a difference between this place and hell, and part of it is, is dealing with the fact that the bottomless pit is the current dwelling place, whereas hell is the final dwelling place. Just like, um, you know, any soul, whenever they die, they go to a temporary dwelling place before going to the final dwelling place. Um, let's look here. Uh, verse 2, you have the smoke arising and it causes for the sun and the air to be darkened. So you have the smoke of the pit darkening the sun and the air. And the idea here is that um, the smoke appears to represent the efforts of Satan. And um, those efforts are used, at least in an attempt, to block the truth of God and his word. Uh, the light of truth is darkened by the deceptions and delusions that are set forth by the devil. Darkness presents itself as a veil to the people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul would say this. He'd say, in the case, uh, in their case, the God of this world, the God of this world would represent Satan, the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2 and verse 2, was blinded. So in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So yeah, Paul at least attesting to this fact that Satan, in in all of his efforts, does uh, darken the mind of some. You look there in verse three, you have the locust emerging from the pit. Um, any instances in which locusts were used in the Old Testament? Ten plagues. Ten plagues. That's the first place they're mentioned in Exodus chapter ten and verses four through twenty. That was God's method of judgment. Uh, upon uh, Pharaoh and Pharaoh's land because of his rebellion to God. Um, I would also say, you know, these are uh, lesser known instances, but locusts were used as a threat against the Israelites in the case that they would turn from God and commit sins. See that in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 38, as well as 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse uh, 35 and 37, and then 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 13. Um, and make a few more remarks here. God used locusts in the days of Joel, and he would refer to them as his great army against the rebellious people of his possession. And so the idea here is that all through the Old Testament, locusts have been uh, depicted as destroyers. And it, that, that is not different at all from what we're seeing here in Revelation chapter 9. These are destroyers. And what we have to recognize about these is that these represent, uh, in a sense, sin and sin's destructive ability. Sin brings its own destruction with it. And so that is something to be ever mindful of. Uh, next Wednesday, we're going to pick up here uh, in verses, uh, I guess probably in like verse 3, and uh, move on from there. I appreciate it. And uh, next week, we're not going to have a, a big old recap.